No, I won't bow to idols. I stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. Cause if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in the suffering, then I join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my will still be seen. Oh, 
death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For then the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made Come on, church, let's sing today. All hail.
Come on, let's sing. All hail. Oh, hail King Jesus. Oh, hail the Lord of heaven and earth. Oh, hail King Jesus. Oh, hail the Savior of the world. Oh, hail King Jesus. starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire i just want to speak the name of jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus
you all pray with me this morning. God, I'm so thankful for your presence here this morning. I'm thankful for the power of the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you open our hearts and minds this morning for whatever you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Um, as you're seated, please make your uh, neighbor welcome. And if you are with us online, we're happy you're here. Well, hello again. I don't know about you. Those are my three of my absolute favorite worship songs, so it was great to enjoy those again. Listen, if you are brand new here at the Vineyard or you've been here a while and you do not yet really feel connected, I want to invite you to fill out the Connect card. It's in the seat back right in front of you. If you fill that out and take that to the Welcome Center in the atrium, there are staff and volunteers there. They would love to get to meet you and answer any questions you have, so I want to invite you to do that. All right, I have just a couple announcements for you this morning. So many of us have children in Vineyard Kids and Vineyard Students. I have two uh, incoming sixth graders myself. They're over at the Student Union. One of them is in complete denial about back to school. She's like, don't talk to me. Nope. Mm -mm -mm. And then the other one has already, she's on Amazon. I need this backpack. I need this pencil case. I need this water bottle. And she's ready to go back tomorrow. So your kids are probably somewhere in that spectrum, but it's coming, like it or not, in a couple of weeks. So we want to launch things off for our kids, just encourage them with some fun. In a couple of weeks on Sunday, August 13th, we're just going to have a kickoff party after both of the services. So we'll have uh, games and food and uh, free snow cones and popcorn, and we're just going to have a great time. So hope you'll plan to meet us uh, out on the patio by the pond in two weeks' time after service. All right, my next announcement is for the women, the beautiful, beautiful women of Vineyard Cincinnati. I see you all out there. Want to invite you to our annual uh, Women's Night of Encouragement. So this is one of my favorite events of the uh, end of the summer. It's just a great time uh, to be together. This is really an event for women of all ages. I brought my girls last year and they invited their friends and their friends' moms came as well, which was awesome. So it's so good for us to be together, the women of this church, but also it's a great opportunity to invite all the women in your life. So sisters, mothers, daughters, your neighbors, your friends, women who go to other churches, it's so good to be together. I don't know any woman who doesn't need to be encouraged. 
And uh, this year, our theme is abide. And as we start the school year, the busyness of the fall, so important to remember the importance of abiding in Jesus. So I hope you'll make plans to join us. It's on Saturday, August 26th in the evening. You can buy your tickets online, vineyardcincinnati.com, or you can purchase them actually after service on the 13th and 20th. All right. Generosity, You know, that is part of who we are here at Vineyard. And one of the ways we demonstrate that principle of generosity is through our Give It All Away initiative. So I'm really excited to tell you that this month we will be blessing with a $20,000 gift, Princeton Closet. Princeton Closet is a nonprofit. Yep, you can go ahead and clap. Let's do it. It's a nonprofit, a partner with Princeton City Schools, and uh, they are amazing. They're going to use our gift to expand their offerings to their students, which will now include access to their food pantry, backpacks, school supplies, and of course, clothing and shoes. So we're really glad to be partnering with them. And today, we are honored to have the executive director of Princeton Closet, Mrs. Susan Wider, and her husband, as well as the brand new superintendent of Princeton City Schools, Mr. Elgin Card. They are all with us here. Would you stand uh, so we can just give you a warm vineyard welcome? We're so glad you could be with us this morning. I know that many of you are Princeton City School District families, and so I want to just encourage you, Mr. Card, Superintendent Card, will be out in the atrium after services, so I hope you'll drop by and say hello and get to know him and avail yourself of that opportunity. All right, Vineyard family, we are blessed to be a blessing to others, and we can only do that through our collective giving. So thank you for your faithfulness in that area. If you came prepared to give today, you have three options. You can text or go online or drop your gift off in the boxes while you're here. Would you pray with me over our offering today? Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you. How wonderful it is to worship you, Jesus. We thank you for your abundance and your generous heart toward us. Help us, Holy Spirit, to live that way, to give back to you freely what you've first given to us, to share our resources with others so that your kingdom will be furthered and your name, Jesus, be glorified. And we love you. We pray in your name. Amen. Good morning, Vineyard family. Uh, hello, good morning. My name is Beth Guckenberger. I'm part of the teaching team here, and I'm so excited to be part of the Psalms of Summer series. This is definitely a cool series, and I haven't had a chance to be in front of you since we've concluded the Legacy of Hope campaign, and so because I'm here in person, I need to tell you from the bottom of my heart, I know I've been sending videos, but here I am telling you, I am so grateful for the way that this church demonstrated their faith for people that you may not ever see on this side of eternity. I got a chance to be in Nigeria last month and your spiritual siblings over there, they're beside themselves. That God would have called a church that they can put their finger on on a globe on the other side and said, those people cared about us. And I, I wanna tell you a story, and I, I want you to please hear my heart in this. I am not trying to put down somebody else so that we can feel good about ourselves. I wanna tell you about a cautionary tale that happened 15, almost 15 years ago that impacted the way that I viewed the kind of work we did through the Legacy of Hope, and I want us, I just wanna add my story. I've been saying lately, I think we all have this bank of testimonies, right? We all have banks with our money in it, but we also have banks of testimonies. And some of the testimonies in our banks come from our own stories, and some of them come from other people's stories. And every once in a while, we need to take a withdrawal out. And I want to put a story in your bank of testimony. It was uh, 2010, just after the Haiti earthquake, that devastating earthquake. And if I haven't met you yet, uh, my husband and I lead Back to Back Ministries, which is a ministry to orphaned and vulnerable children. 
And we were at a, like a symposium that they invited executive directors of nonprofits like ours to gather together. We were in Grand Rapids and there was a speaker about to address us and they were reading his bio and they said in his bio that he had been a missionary for 24 years in Haiti. And I immediately sat up because the average length of a missionary stay in Haiti is about eight months. So if somebody stayed there 24 years, they have learned some things. They're gonna have some spiritual depth that I knew was going to be a gift to all of us who would listen to him. And the guy got up and he's like, hey, I've I'm, I'm been an agricultural missionary for the last couple of decades. And he was talking about how his, his role in the country was to help teach Haitians how to use their natural resources to grow crops so they can feed themselves. And he went into a little bit of the history of the U.S. agricultural supplement. I don't need to go in that today. But as a result of some of those efforts, they... They weren't able, they had generations that didn't understand how to use the land to provide for themselves. And so he was using his skills in that area to reach people for Jesus and to help them have the, need, the food they needed for development. And he said, but this year since the earthquake, there was an organization who invited children all over the United States to buy jars of peanut butter and take 50 cents to the lid of it and ship it to Miami and then that 50 cents was to cover the freight of that jar of peanut butter on a container that went over to Port-au-Prince. And I understand what that organization was trying to do. They were trying to think of a, a source of protein that didn't need refrigerated, an easy way for people to get involved with the things that we were seeing on our televisions that were hard to watch. And he, he at this point in this story, in his, in his message, started to cry. And he said, uh, our, our chief crop was the peanut crop, and nobody we'll buy our peanuts anymore because they can just go down to, the, down to Port-au-Prince to the docks and just get free peanut butter. If somebody would have just asked me, I would have said, save your $4 from that jar of peanut butter and the 50 cents you put on the top and the, $10, the $6 it costs you to ship it. And send me $10. I'll buy better tools and more land and pay better wages and we'll help more people. And that sustainable work will have a generational kind of impact. And I sat there thinking, oh, Jesus, how many times have I ever done what I thought was right, but I forgot to listen and ask what somebody actually needed? And I want you to know, this is a church that's listening. We're listening to Princeton City Schools. We're listening over there at the Healing Center. We're listening to people on the other side of the globe. We are listening. We are listening to people, and we're listening to the Lord. And our generosity is going to fit inside of work that God is doing over a span of generations. And I felt so honored to represent you this summer over there, and I can't wait for some of you to get a chance to see it. So anyway, that was a long preamble to say thank you for the Legacy of Hope. I've been enjoying this series. I hope you had a chance to listen to Clay last weekend when he talked to us about a, the fear of man in Psalm 118, and today I'm going to talk about a passage that is possibly the most familiar passage in our, our whole Bibles. People who don't even share our faith know this passage. They say it when they're in their hospital beds. Soldiers take it in pieces of paper across into battlefield. I mean, people know Psalm 23. And I was thinking about how, in, if I was to like circle us all up and say, T tell me what you think, who is the Lord? What is the Lord? What do we know about him? I would imagine in a room like this, we would hear things like God is omniscient and he's omnipotent, and he is all-powerful, and he is good. But we have been trained in this kind of Western, Greek-influenced kind of education. And so we use words like that to describe what we can't quite get our mind around. In Hebraic thought, where David would have written this psalm and still true today, they use word pictures. If I ask them, who's the Lord, they would say, God is a rock. God is a strong tower. He's the light of the world. He is the shepherd. And so today I'm going to ask you to exercise your, your creativity muscles. And we're going to see that Psalm 23 is actually a series of pictures, not words. And I want to paint some pictures in your mind because in a moment when you might need it, whether you're in a hospital bed or you're a soldier or you just find yourself in the middle of the night afraid, I want you to hold on to the picture as much as you hold on to those words. The first part of the psalm says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I kind of love that the first thing the shepherd does after he tells me that he is my shepherd is tell me to lie down, right? We live in an anxious culture. There was a report published in May of this year with the American Psychiatric Association, 
and it says 70% of U.S. adults say they feel anxious or extremely anxious about keeping themselves or their families safe. Nearly two in five adults say they feel more anxious today than they were a year ago today. We live in an anxious culture. And it's natural to think, it's, it's, it's a natural kind of thing to worry. There's a lot of unknown. Things are changing really fast around us. But that kind of ruminating, that kind of worry, it's meditating, which our Bible tells us to do, it's just meditating in the wrong direction, right? It's focusing on and fixating on what we don't know or what we don't have instead of trusting in this promise. We, don't, we, don't, we lack nothing. In 2010, the first time I ever went to Israel, I had a chance to, I was like riding in this bus, and all of a sudden, our guide stopped us and said, hey, we're going to get out and observe, observe something. So we all got out on the side of the road, and I took a picture of what it was that we were observing with my iPhone, just just because I wanted to not forget it. So you all can do this exercise with me. He said, what, what do you see when you, what, like, what do you see there? And the first thing, it was a shepherd with a bunch of sheep and the black animals or goats. And I said, well, the first thing I see is like, the sheep are lined up, like follow the leader. Like I didn't know sheep, fought, so they walked in a straight line. I now know that the word we use in Hebrew for the line that sheep walk on is the same root word we use to translate in English as paths of righteousness, like sheep literally walk on paths of righteousness. And the second thing I said, I wasn't trying to be funny. I just said, I don't think we like pick the sharpest shepherd in the shack because there's like no grass on this hill. Like he took his animals to go graze somewhere where there's no grass. And the guide goes, oh, no, 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 there, there's grass here, Beth. Look under the rock. The dew from the morning gets stuck under the rock, and if you lift up the rock, you'll see like a little patch of grass. So I walked around, and I picked up all these rocks. The thickest tuft of grass I could find was like the size of a human fist. And he said, now watch the shepherd. The shepherd is walking along the path of righteousness, and it's, it can see where the rocks are coming up, where the, the grass is, and he's telling the sheep, hey, there's some, hey, right there. Hey, there's a bite. Hey, you can get a bite right there. Hey, you can get a bite right there. And the sheep have to be on the path of righteousness so they are in hearing distance from the shepherd so they can find out where the grass is going to be. And the sheep are listening to the shepherd, grabbing their little tuft of grass. You know how long it takes to chew a tuft of grass the size of a human fist? Like two steps. So the sheep like get their bite, take two steps. Now they need more grass. So they got to stay on the path of righteousness so they can listen for the next step. And I'm watching all this and thinking about it. And I said, Hey, nobody better get their Bibles out and read to us Psalm 23, because when I think about green pastures, I'm thinking about a field full of waist-high alfalfa. Like, I'm not thinking about this little tiny tuft of grass stuck underneath a rock. Like, what do you mean this is what the Lord is providing for me as green pastures? But that scene is exactly the kind of scene David would have been in. And my, my teacher challenged me, Beth, the picture you have in your mind is a picture of independence that, with that waist-high alfalfa. You can eat whatever you want, whenever you want, however much you want. You can lie down, feel cool. It's all about you. You're in control. The picture that God is painting in this is a picture and a posture of dependence. You got to stay on the path of righteousness and listen for the shepherd's voice. And when you do so, you will lack nothing. You will have everything that you need. That's why they say worry is like dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's grass. There isn't actually enough grass for that. This is why we worry about it. And Lie down in Hebrew doesn't mean like time out. Like I'm your shepherd, now lie down. It's a, it's a verb that means like pleasantness, something to be enjoyed. Philip Keller, he's a, a shepherd who wrote a book called A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23, writes that sheep do not lie down easily unless four conditions are met. Because they're timid, they won't lie down if they're afraid. Because they're social, they won't lie down if there's any friction among the sheep. They won't lie down if any kind of fly or parasites trouble them. And they, if they're anxious at all about food or they're hungry, they won't lie down. So rest only happens because our shepherd will deal with our fear and our friction and our flies and our famine. And I promise you, here we are today. He brought you here today because he wants to deal with your fear. He wants to deal with your friction. He wants to deal with your flies and your famine. And the first step in accepting this kind of kind invitation of him taking over as my shepherd, dealing with the things that make me anxious, is for me to lie down. He's on it. I have a friend who 
lives in another state and they have an adult daughter with a substance addiction. And if any of you have, are parenting a child with addiction, you know what a complicated story that is. They got a call one night that their daughter had been picked up with a DUI and they were trying to make decisions about how fast they go to her and what do they do and how do they, are they enabling her? Are they supporting her? What do they do? That's a hard decision. So they asked a couple of prayer warriors to pray that they would know how and when and how fast to go and what to do. So I just started praying, and later that night, I got a text from the dad, and he said, I am so grateful for tonight for Scott and Sharon. His daughter, Stephanie, checked into a cabin at a KOA. She had no luggage, no car, no bags. She wore a black Velcro ankle bracelet. Sharon noticed as she checked into her cabin, and she later told her husband, Scott, about this young woman, and Scott said he couldn't just sit by and do nothing. So later that evening, my daughter, Stephanie, heard a knock on her cabin, and she and Sharon stood there with a plastic tub full of bed linens and a pillow and a towel and a blanket. And he said, I don't need to know any details. We just want you to know you are loved and here are some bed sheets. Steph started to cry and he said, don't cry, just show us that smile. And she just told us the whole story on FaceTime, lying on fresh white sheets. That's when I cried, the dad writes. I'm so amazed at their simple act of love and care. It was like angels stepped in what I've been fretting about all night, that I'm not there. Like, first of all, I think those people would fit in just fine in this church because we know that simple acts of love done with extraordinary kindness put on display the kind of kingdom work that we're talking about here. That's exactly what these guys did. But secondly, I'm thinking to myself, lie down, sheep, he's on it. He cares about what we care about, right? He knows he's sovereign. He's in control. He can be trusted. I honestly wonder if worry offends him. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. So I want you to paint this picture in your mind. It's kind of funny, but this, the, the leading cause of death in a desert is actually flooding because there's these canyons called wadis. They're, they're like, they're like, from past floods, the way they cut through the rock, they create these big floods. And if you are standing in a wadi when a flood comes and one of these crazy storms, you will be utterly killed, destroyed. You'll drown in it. And that's the leading cause of death in a desert. And after the flood comes through, there'll be a little bit of water that is left standing at the bottom of the wadi. And that is mighty tempting if you're in the desert and you're thirsty. But a good shepherd knows you don't want to go to that kind of water because now you're in a very vulnerable position. And if there should be a flash flood, you're gone. And so a good shepherd would not lead you to those waters. He would lead you to some quiet waters. It's a picture. This is a psalm that is a picture of followership, right? We are quick to think like, I mean, just one little drink of that water won't hurt me. It's just right there. I am very thirsty. I mean, what are the chances that's going to flood today? I'm going to just go over there and just like, but God is like, hey, I am your shepherd. Follow me. Trust me. I can see ahead. I can see <clears throat> those quiet waters that he wants to lead us to quiet can also be translated as restful. I mean, does anybody here in the house need rest this weekend? It's a place of trust, of confidence a place where we can rely on him. And I, I think to, to myself, rest comes when I'm, I'm believing inside of me that my shepherd's all, he's taking care of my fear and my flies and my famine and my friction. And sometimes we can actually prefer the energy we get from fleas and flies and famine and friction and fear that stirring up, I think I need to do something about it. There's actually energy that can come and we can get really familiar with that kind of energy and it can be so familiar it starts to feel normal or right. Todd and I, for a period of time um, as missionaries, were house parents for students who had grown up in children's homes and were then living with us as they completed secondary and post-secondary education. And we eventually became like the principal over a series of homes like that. Those homes managed themselves, but when a situation escalated, then they would call us in like a a principal. And one of the the boys' homes was like, had the most spectacular house parents. They were like way better at this than I was. They would have like 
after school snack time, then homework time, then like craft time and game time and make dinner together time and then eat time and like movie night. And they were amazing at it. And they got this really difficult boy on a Monday and he kept trying to sabotage their systems. He was very difficult, but those house parents were amazing. Cool as cucumbers, managing all of his difficulties. And we were all watching so impressed. And then one, about a week later, one day, one of the other boys in the house came running to me and said, you gotta come quick. Their house dad, he's flipped his lid. So I came over and I walked into the house and the, the difficult new student was cool, was cool and collected. And the house dad was losing his mind. And I said to the student, hey, what's, what's going on? What happened here? And he's like, I can finally breathe. It's like, these people have been so nice. It's driving, I couldn't even breathe. It was like driving me crazy. Finally look at them, they're, they're, it's chaos. This feels normal to me. And in the aftermath of that discussion, I said to the house parents, his set point is chaos. He's only ever known crazy town. People fighting, yelling, destructive. That's all he's ever known. He was trying to recreate all he's ever known inside of your house. Your job is not gonna be easy, but you've got to actually change his set point so that he has an appetite for connection, relationship, attachment, peace. That's what your job is. Some of us have a set point for fear and famine and flies and friction. And Jesus is like, hey, I wanna, I wanna change your appetite. I want you to get used to what it feels like to lie down and let me as the shepherd take over. I want you to get used to what it looks like to eat every two steps, like to, to be in that kind of place of dependence with me. The truth is I can thirst for all kinds of things. And I, and I can see some waters and think that water over there, that's gonna do the trick, that's gonna help me. But only he knows the waters that are safe for me and it says, he leads me behind the side, quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Literally, that means like my soul comes back to me. He, he turns around my soul. He literally repents me. I can't repent myself. I can't turn myself back. I'm a sheep. I can't find my way home. I can't, I can't forgive. It, it, it's something only he can do. He can refresh my soul and then guide me along the right path for his name's sake. We've already talked about lying down in quiet waters. Here we're talking about refreshment and rest and its correlation with being on that path of righteousness, that straight line that those sheep are on. Jeremiah will say it like this. This is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Do any of you feel like you're at a crossroads? You don't know. Should you go right or left, here or there, stop or go? Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is. Walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. If you don't, the consequences are brutal. Because he made us and he sees us, he can see much better what's ahead than we can when we're just kind of fumbling about. And where do we get that kind of instruction? How do we hear his voice? How do we know where he says left or right, here or there, stop or go? We hear his voice because we get used to, we, we read it in the word. We wanna know what he says, what he sounds like, this is what he sounds like. And if we, if we can study his word, we can be led by him. And if we do, the fruit has generational impact. It has, it has implications beyond what we see. Whether we go right or left, stop or go, those decisions don't just impact today and us. Those kind of decisions impact tomorrow and them. One of my favorite examples of someone who understood the correlation between hearing God's word, reading God's word and hearing his voice and hearing his voice and doing the right thing is this story of a woman that lived 100 years ago. 1928, there was a Sunday school teacher out of First Presbyterian Hollywood. Her name was Henrietta Mears. And Henrietta Mears wrote the really cleverly titled book, What the Bible is About. That was my attempt at sarcasm. I'm not actually that good at it, but there, there you have it. <laughs> she, um, she was faithful. She was faithful to listen to God's voice, to read his word, and to stay on the path. Some of the students that she had in her Sunday school class were Bill and Vonette Bright. They founded Campus Crusade for Christ, which in part is, was responsible for the Jesus film seen today by eight billion people. 
One of their students was Dawson Trotman. Dawson Trotman is the founder of Navigators. They today have staff in 103 nations. Jim Rayburn, the founder of Young Life. I'm so grateful. That's where my husband came to know the Lord. Richard Halbertson, he was the U.S. Senate chaplain. He was the chairman of World Vision. Uh, our 40th president, Ronald Reagan, was in her classroom. Billy Graham, who preached the gospel to 80 million people. This woman decided to stay on the path and teach children how to read their Bibles and the implications of her faithfulness has impacted the world many times over. In contrast, the guy that wrote Psalm 23, David, had a son who did not heed this instruction. And that son was a, was a boy named Solomon who grew up to be king. And Solomon decided, I think the waters at the bottom of the wadi will quench my thirst just fine. Even though he was told not to marry someone outside of his faith, he did anyways. Actually, a whole bunch of people he married outside of his faith. He allowed those women to set up gods, the gods they worshipped from their own face in his household, raised his children to worship those gods. It was so outside of God's plan for his life that God took the entire kingdom away from him. When we decide to not listen to Jesus, whether we should go left or right, up or down, stop or go, implications are generational. And the Lord is my shepherd, it says. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Let these pictures paint in your mind. He refreshes my soul. He brings my soul back to me, guides me along right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I want you to paint a picture in your mind of a shepherd, every piece of art you've ever seen. I've seen a shepherd with a crook, right? That's what shepherds carry. I don't know if I've ever seen a depiction of a shepherd that has his staff in one side and a rod in the other. But I want you to understand that staff, it, that, that's to direct, right? That's to redirect sheep that like decide maybe that goat has a good idea and I'm going to go over there and see if I can find some better grass and that shepherd uses that that staff to like redirect no stay on the path of righteousness listen to my voice I'll give you everything you need and you will lack nothing but in his other hand he has a rod you know why he has a rod because he wants to protect those sheep from the things that threaten them from that which is going to come against them kingdom of priests we are shepherds we I mean, we've talked about it before. Some of the only depictions, demonstrations of biblical truth that some people will see are the ones as, are, are us and what we put on display. If we're generous, they'll get the idea God is generous. If we're kind and merciful, they'll get the idea God is kind and merciful. Like, we have to put on display what this looks like. So that means because God walks with me in the darkest valley, I'm to walk with other people in their dark valleys. I'm to help protect them. Redirect them on the path. I brought a story, a, a video I want to show you, an example of someone who's on staff with Back to Back. He works here in Cincinnati over in Lower Price Hill where we have a work, and he's talking about what it looked like for him to walk in a valley with one of the students. Watch this with me. Hello, my name is Michael Sickles. I am the Youth Programs Development Manager at the Cincinnati site. Um, so many opportunities that God has shown up, but there's one situation uh, when I was coaching a young man, and I remember we were going to the summer, he had just turned 18, and a conversation we had, he, he, was, he turned to me and said, I don't belong, men in my life don't stay, men in my life aren't healthy, and men aren't present. And so I remember a couple weeks after that, I'm, I'm sitting in my house, I'm just really thinking about that conversation, and my phone rings, and I look at the phone, and I don't recognize the number, so I don't answer it. And about 10 minutes later, the phone rings again. It's the same number. So I'm like, okay, it's two times. So I answer the, answer the phone, and it's this young man. He says, Mr. Mike. He says, I'm in jail. I'm like, okay, how are you holding up? What do you need, and what can I do? And so I schedule a time to go visit him. I visit with him, and I say, hey, when you get out of here, we're going to get together. Think about next steps, and we're going to move forward. So a couple weeks go by. He's out. Again, I'm sitting at home just really thinking about this story, and my phone rings again. I look at the phone, now this time I recognize the number, so I answer it, and I'm like, hello, and it's this young man again. He says, Mr. Mike, I don't know what happened, but I'm back in jail again. I'm like, okay. I was like, how are you holding up? What do you need, and what can I do? So I schedule another time to go visit him, um, and, and we talk, and again, I say, hey, we'll revisit the plan when you get out, we'll figure out next steps, and we'll go from there. So this time I got an opportunity to, to get him when he gets out. I was able to take him to his family's house, and I said, hey, tomorrow's a new day. And we're going to figure this out. 
So I drop him off and I go home and I'm getting settled. And again, my phone rings. I look at it, it's the same number and I'm, I'm puzzled. And so I answer the phone. It's this young man that I coach and he says, I'm here again. And in that moment, I remember scheduling a time to go see him. And again, he's 18, so he's in the adult jail system. So I go in there, and he's these big columns, and these big bays, and there's this glass, plexiglass, and there's this old school pay phone that I have to talk through. And I remember waiting for him to come in, and I said, God, there's got to be a different way. He walks in, has his head down, and silence. He's not looking at me, and out of nowhere, he just says, Mr. Mike, why do you keep showing up? And I said, because you belong. And this is what love looks like. And in that moment, I can hear him weeping on the phone. And he looks up at me and says, will you pray with me? And we're in the jail praying. And from that moment, he never went back to jail again. And he graduated high school, got his own apartment, still navigating life. But it's just amazing to see how God just continues to show up in multiple ways when we're just faithful to him and, and from the prayers and support of everybody. So thank you. Yeah, that's a good story. Michael is an amazing man, but honestly, he's just a shadow reflection of your good shepherd who literally will always take your call from your metaphorical jail. He will always come for you. He will always bring his rod and his staff. He will always he will always prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Like, again, paint a picture. What does it look like to sit at a table with the Lord in the presence of your enemies? If I wrote this, I'd be like, and, and, and you prepare a table for me far, 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 far away from my enemies. I don't want to be in the presence of my enemies. You think the enemy is satisfied? Like, okay, well, she's busy right now. She's eating with the Lord. I'm going to come back for her later. No, he's not satisfied that. He's gonna try to pull up a chair and sit with us. And you know what the soundtrack of our enemy sounds like? What his kind of psalms sound like? They sound like this, you can't trust God. This is gonna be all up to you. And by the way, you suck. Sounds like sin is no big deal. You're never going to change. His soundtrack sounds like, hey, grace is for other people, not for you. You, you, you haven't earned it. Your past now defines you. The enemy says all kinds of lies, but we have a choice. Wh whose song are we gonna listen to? Are we gonna listen to what God has written to us, the ancient of days? Are we gonna hold on to these word pictures? Are we gonna let the sounds of an enemy who has no business sitting at our table influence our thinking, our feelings, our relationships, our decisions, our direction? Because the enemy is constantly trying to get us to stop following the shepherd. He's always going to try to convince us there is no point in continuing this. And while the devil is telling us there is no way, you are not going to make it through this valley. Our good shepherd says, hey, I'm, I'm with you in the valley. You can't control who or what prowls around your table. And he definitely is a prowler. But you do have the authority, God has given you authority to invite to and away from the table anybody you want. You can say, I have power in the name of Jesus. We just sang it earlier today. You enemy, you can't sit here. You enemy, I won't listen to you. You enemy, you're not gonna touch me or my mind in those ways. Because you know why? He has anointed my head with oil and my cup, it overflows. This idea of the overflowing cup, this is an ancient principle that comes from the Bedouin culture. Bedouin culture is these nomadic shepherds. They still exist today. I just saw some Bedouin when I was in Nigeria last month. They're these nomad, if you go, they're like nomadic shepherds. They were around in the days of David. If you go into a Bedouin tent and they offer you coffee or tea or water in a cup and you drink that whole cup and you put it back down, it is their custom. They cannot not do this. They will refill the cup. And if you're like, okay, that was great. I was, didn't even really want to drink the first cup, but here we go. And you drink the second cup because you're their guest and you put the cup down, they're going to fill it a third time. If you want to signal to the host, you don't want anything else to drink, you leave a little bit in the bottom of the cup. It works the same way with God. If you hold back, if you, if you do some self-preservation, if you think, God, you can have everything, but I'm going to kind of keep this, you don't get your cup refilled. The overflowing cup is give it all away. Pour it all out. 
Church, I promise you, we can afford to be as generous as we are being. We have, the source of our cup is unending. He will never not give you what you need, always. What do you need? Mercy, patience, peace, kindness, discernment, wisdom, provision, protection. It doesn't matter. He is the God of the overflowing cup, and with him, your cup overflows. David finishes this psalm by saying, surely, that word surely, hear me say this with the heart that I'm trying to, it's like the sound of an attached child, or maybe you would kind of say an entitled child, but in the best possible way, like, I know you're going to do this. You're my dad and you always come for me. Surely, I'm confident of this. Surely, your goodness and your love will follow, also translated pursue. I just don't want you to think like following along, like God is in hot pursuit of you and those that you love. Surely, goodness and love will pursue you all the days of your life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These are the pictures he wants us to paint in our mind that we can pull up in the middle of the night. We can pull up when we're taking our, when one of our eyes or eye in the, the water at the bottom of the wadi. When we're like, really? Just this much grass? This is all you got for me right now? This isn't good enough. I want more. When you're worrying and fretting, these are the word pictures he wants to call to your mind. Would you stand with me as we finish our time together by reading this psalm together out loud? And just take maybe 10 or 15 seconds to think about something that worries you. You're just concerned about. You're wondering, are you paying attention to this health crisis? Are you paying attention to this protocol? Are you paying attention to this problem? Are you paying attention, Lord? Ask him. And then hear this as his response to you. Ready? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I'm not afraid Though I'm surrounded by enemies I'm not afraid Even in sickness and trembling I'm not afraid No, I'm not afraid I'm not alone I feel rejected, I'm not alone Now I can see his perspective, I'm not alone No, I'm not alone Come on, sing, he is He is the good shepherd and Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no all my needs and in everything surely goodness and mercy will follow me all of my days well, let's sing you are the Lord you are the Lord worthy 
of all adoration, you are the Lord, surpassing all my expectations, you are the Lord. I sing you by the my soul and me talk that one more time. I will dwell in the house of the Lord just together. Oh, I will dwell in the house, the house of the Lord. Oh, I will dwell in the house, the house of the Lord. Oh, I will dwell in the house, the house of the Lord. You all sound like a choir today. That's amazing. I want to invite the ministry team to come forward and uh, put up that ministry slide. If you're new here, I want to help you understand what's on that slide. There are people who are gifted and have committed as their ministry to be praying in anticipation of today. What might the Lord want to do? What, Lord, do you have, what kind of good works do you have prepared in advance for us? And they've listed some of the things they heard the Lord say to them this week. And if any of those words resonate with the story in your life and you want to come forward for prayer, that's exactly what these ministry teams want to do. But during that last song, I was also thinking to myself about some of us that might have been thinking during that study of those words, I'm in a valley or I'm afraid to pour out the rest of my cup, or I'm attracted to waters that aren't very quiet. If you have something that the Lord was stirring in you, that is exactly what these folks are gifted and trained to do, to listen and to pray alongside you for strength, comfort, healing, protection, whatever it is that you need, peace. And if you aren't at a place where you wanna come forward for prayer, don't leave here without at least staying for a minute and praying alone to the Lord or praying with who you came with. And we also have communion cups. 
it might be a good moment for you, you and the Lord, before you leave the house today to take communion and tell him, I heard you. You are my shepherd. I'll follow you. I'll stay on the path of righteousness. I trust you. And then seal that with with your expression of communion. That, That might be a way today that you can yet continue to worship. I also want to remind you that in the atrium, you'll have a chance, especially if you're in the Princeton City Schools to interact with our new superintendent over there, Superintendent Carr, take the chance to greet him and welcome him to the vineyard and to this community um, on behalf and to the rest of us as we leave here today. I, I hear this in my heart every single time I'm up here, go, let's go. Let's go, let's, let's go, let's go out into the world and show them a different kind of king, a different kind of shepherd, Let's represent the way that he's willing to walk with people and let's walk with people. Let's, let's, let's go, family. This is the anointing he has for us. He has anointed your head. You don't have to worry about pouring out. His cup will overflow. So would you pray with me as I send us all out today? Jesus, in your holy and precious name, I, I tell you, I hear your spirit and I respond to it. I will go. I will go. I will have eyes to see. I will listen to what somebody actually is asking for and I will respond to it in your name, not in my name, not in this church's name, in your name. It is with the power and authority that you give us as co-heirs with you that I ask you release an anointing on this whole body. You anoint them with oil. Be with them, tell them left or right, show them the right path. We trust you, we love you, and we honor you today. And I pray all these things in the name of your resurrected son, Jesus, amen. Amen, join us next week as Matt finishes up the series. God bless.